Hello, good morning. I hope you're all awake. My name is Manuel Klimek, uh, and I work for Google on C++ tools and generally on making C++ uh, easier to develop. And today I'll talk about how we rolled out C++ modules uh, to our hundreds of millions of lines of code, code base. Overall, this will be the story of how we went from this graph to this graph and how that made us both, both very happy and very sad. But before I tell you that story, you'll need to learn a bit about how we de develop code at Google. At Google, we have a very large, um, continuously integrated code base. Most of our development is done in that code base. For C++, we have a couple of hundred million lines of code in there that's handwritten. And we have roughly the same amount of generated code. It's continuously integrated. That means that if you submit a change, everybody in the whole company will immediately see that change. And to be able to develop that way, of course, we need to run all the builds and all the tests of all the transitive reverse dependencies of your code. And to do that, you can obviously not do that on your single machine every time you submit something. So in our data centers, we have a lot of machines that do nothing but compile code and run tests. They also cache the results. So if you compile again, you basically get the cached results back. Um, we've published a couple of papers on this. So if you, if you search for Google's build system, you will find more details on the internet. Um, if you look at the amount of generated code, right, we have roughly the same amount of generated code as we have handwritten code. Uh, that might seem like a lot of code. Um, but it turns out that this is mostly one kind of generated code, and that's protocol buffers. Who here has ha heard of protocol buffers? Ah, most of you, okay. So protocol buffers are how our servers communicate with, with each other, and so they're really important. In general, it's just a simple um, data description language, right? In this example, you have a message that has one field bar, and the protocol compiler compiles that into a C++ header file that gives you getters and setters. And we use protocol compilers, um, uh, the protocol buffers, all over our code, right? They are the main dependencies. And now let's look in a more low level how we build stuff. So our build system has evolved out of a um, make file based system. So basically, originally we had a single make file at the root of this large continuously integrated tree. And it turns out that doesn't scale, right? So at some point, we thought, well, we'll build our own build system. That is now open source. It's called Bazel. You can use it. And I'll explain a bit about how the syntax works, how we describe our builds. So it's very Python-y, right? You can see here, an, you see an example of a couple of libraries, right? You have a proto library um, named p. It has a source p.proto, right? That's what we generate the C++ source code from. And then we have two other libraries, a library A. We see that we specify headers. Uh, that's kind of interesting because many C++ build systems don't specify their headers. We do that because it has turned out that letting everybody just include headers from all over the code base is a bad idea, right? It, people then basically use the implementation details of other people's libraries and they cannot change it anymore. And we of course specify the sources that those are the translation units that are compiled, right? And then next we specify the dependencies on a high level here, CC library B has dependencies on the library A and the protocol buffer library P. And if you look at how this then gets compiled, let's just take a translation unit out of that as an example, right? So here we have B.CC and let's say B.CC includes A1.H, B.H, other.H and P.P.H. And now when we want to compile this, we need to ship the source code to our distributed builder. So the question is what source code do we need to ship? Well, the first idea is we just ship everything that's specified in the headers of the transitive dependencies and the source code itself. Right? In this case, we have b.cc, b.h, 
a1.h, a2.h, and p.bb.h. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that a2.h is actually not used. So that, that seems wasteful. We want to get rid of that, and so we included a local optimization that's called include scanning. So the build system actually follows the includes through all the files, right? It has a preprocessor implementation and uh, figures out what headers a source file actually needs. So it figures out a2.h is actually not needed, so it's not an input to this action, so we don't need to send it to the remote executor. Additionally, you see that p.cc includes other.h. So the interesting part is why we would like that all headers in the code base are fully specified. They are currently not. We are working on that. It's a multi-year effort. As long as that's not done, we need to also detect additional headers we have to send. So this is basically the core of how our build system works. Now, we want to roll out modules. So when we say modules here, what do we mean with that? Uh, this was multiple years ago, right? Um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to take Clang's module implementation at the time, and uh, we knew that at some point modules would be standardized, but we had no idea what that would look like. So we said we do not want to make any changes to syntax in our code. Uh, that means, right, we want to still spell out the hash includes hash includes, and, um, but we, what we would want to allow is semantic changes because we had, um, we had people previously trying to do pre-compiled headers and most of the time they ran into problems when they wanted to keep the semantics of C++ with pre-compiled headers and that basically took away all the upsides. So we allow changes in semantics, we do not allow changes in syntax. And now we have a bit of background of how we build code, how our build system works, and what kind of modules we actually want to address. But the question stands, why do we, did we want to do that? So why not just wait until modules are standardized, right, and then implement it? That seems lower risk. But we know that for a code base of multiple hundred million lines of code, what you actually need to do is you need to start early because it takes many, many years to make a large change to the code base. So we wanted to start early. We also wanted to start early because we want to gain implementation insights, right? We have people working in our C++ team who are also parts of the standards committee, and they wanted to be able to contribute that insight from our implementation, from our experiments back to the standardization process. So we make sure that when modules are standardized, um, it's not standardized in a way that precludes us from getting the benefits that we need for a large C++ code base. Um, and more importantly, why we wanted to start was that we had a really bad problem. And to get a look at just how bad it got, you can look at this graph. So this graph started back in 2013 when we started to look into why our builds are getting slower. So we had this, this intuition, something is getting slower, what's actually happening here? And uh, I did some log shuffling and I found out that some people actually change a test file and then they run their compile and then it takes one minute for the compiler to get back to them with, well, you forgot a semicolon here. And at that point, I was like, why, why are they not coming with pitchforks at us? That seems like really bad productivity. And the problem is it's a bit of a boiling frog problem, right? It just gets slowly worse over time. And the big problem that we see here is this graph goes up to the right. This is super linear. We really like those graphs when they mean money earned. We don't like them when it's cost, right? And um, if you explain to people who provision for the machines you need for building things that, well, our, our requirements for, for building our code base actually super linear increase, they're like, well, that's, that's not something we can continue to do. So we wanted to address this problem. To address this problem, we first had to understand what's actually going on here. Um, and so we looked into why those things happened. The first idea we had was, well, perhaps optimization is getting slow. Had nothing to do with optimization. Perhaps the compilers are getting slower. 
In fact, no, the compilers had been getting faster over time per, per line of code. What really has happened is that the transitive closure of includes that we expand into the preprocessed file grew super linearly. Um, so we had, overall we had translation units that turned out to be more than 10 million lines of code after preprocessing. So where does this come from, right? We already knew that we have lots of uh, generated code. We have all these protocol buffers. And now these protocol buffers have some interesting properties. Um, first, the example I showed you previously was a simplification. Right? If you have a very simple message with a single field, the protocol buffer actually expands into roughly what you can see here. Right? Uh, we have many overloads for the setters. We have many more like side methods we have. Actually, what's missing here is all the reflection parts that also get generated. And basically, you see two parts of the protocol buffer file, right? You see the declarations of all the methods we need for the fields, and then we see the inline definitions. And we have the inline definitions because we need it to be fast, right? It's what connects our servers. We need this path to be super fast. This is actually the hot path in our code. Um, additionally, we have the problem that if a protocol buffer depends on a different protocol buffer's type, it would just directly hash include that header. So this actually just transitively expands all uh, dependencies of a protocol buffer every time you use it. So the first idea we had was, well, this is easy to solve, right? We, it seems like in, in op mode we need those inline functions, but in debug mode we probably don't need them. So we just uh, if def them out. The, the preprocessor is actually really good at just jumping over stuff you don't need. And we implemented that and our graph changed. So it gave us some relief, but that only lasted for a very short time because we did not actually address the underlying problem. Right? The, after that change, again, the super linear growth just persisted. So how do we address the root cause here? There are two possible ways to address the root cause. The first is, well, this is a protocol buffer problem. Let's address it in the protocol compiler, right? We can hack up the protocol compiler to work around the fact that it needs this, those transitive includes. Um, the problem with that approach is obviously that will only help us for, protocol, for the protocol buffers. We also have a lot of code and an um, increasing number of lines of code for the rest of the code base. So we thought, instead of hacking the protocol compiler and actually figuring out how to make it not need the types of its direct dependencies, right, you can do template magic and stuff, what if we just change how we compile code on a more fundamental level? Right? And there the idea of modules comes, obviously, in. We store the AST. The idea to make that actually scale is that you lazily load the symbols from the module file, um, if you want more details on all the technical parts, you will have to go to Richard's talk, um, which will also talk more about uh, the, how this all um, applies to the TS in the afternoon. And in this talk, I will continue to talk about how we implemented that in the code base. So the first thing because before we wanted to roll that out is we wanted to make sure that we actually have an understanding of what would happen, right? We didn't want to just go and do it because we knew it's a lot of effort. So let's predict what happens. To predict what happens, we have to look at how we, how we think modules will change the fundamental compilation. And let's look at an example, right? You have a couple of translation units, t1.d4.cc, and they all have the, include the same chain of headers, right? C.h includes B.h includes A.h. Now, in the current model, in the old model, what happens is that you distribute all of them to build workers, right? And each of the build workers will, in parallel, just take one of the source files, parse A.h, parse B.h, parse C.h, and uh, the translation unit, and compile the output. So 
The nice property of this is that you can do all of this in parallel. And the problem you see is that we do a lot of work, right? Every green box here means that something needs to be parsed. So we, we actually spend a lot of time reparsing the same headers over and over and over again. With modules, this will look different, right? With modules, we will take a header in this example, a.h, and we compile what we call a header module. That's the PCM file in Clangland for that, right? So a.h will be compiled into a.pcm. And then a.pcm and b.h will be the input for the compilation of b.h into b.pcm, and then we comp compile c.pcm, and all of these then are the input to the compilation of the translational units, and those again can happen in parallel. So if you know about distributed systems, what we, what we did was basically we introduced a larger serial step, right? In theory, this shouldn't actually make a difference, right? Because we actually do the same amount of work in just serially before we do the parallel steps. But in practice, in a distributed system, you always have communication overhead, right? You always have some latency when you, when, for example, a.pcm is compiled on a different machine than the t4.cc. So we expect some overhead here, but we don't expect that overhead to be, like, significant. On the other hand, for the single translation unit recompile case, so let's take the example where somebody just edits a test. So, for example, t1.cc. And they just make, right, they, they just add some new lines of code. In the old system, what would happen is that we would recompile A, B, and C, reparse A, B, and C to compile t.cc. And with modules now, all we need to do is we need to reparse t1.cc and take the modules as input. So here we expect some serious speedup. So to conclude, with modules, we expect some longer critical path. We don't exactly know how that will turn out. We expect it to be not too bad. We expect a lot of uh, speed up for incremental compiles, right? That was what our original problem also was. And also, we expect less CPU use overall, because if you remember, right, the, the parallel compilations, all the headers get recompiled all the time in the old model. So we don't do that. We save some CPU, hopefully. So now we want to roll that out over all of our code. The question is, how do we start? If you want to make such a large change, you want to find something small where you get, uh, for with very little effort, get a lot of benefit, right? Because your team needs to actually pay for itself over time. You cannot just, for 10 years, uh, develop something that hopefully has um, impact at the end. So you need some incremental impact. So, Turns out that protocol buffers, as you probably expected by now, are the perfect example again, right? It's the largest problem we found, and it's also a very, um, very small problem comparably, because if you want to change all protocol buffers, right, if there are semantic changes that require us to change protocol buffers, we just change the generator. We don't have to actually go all over the code base and change code all over the code base, because that's actually a lot uh, harder. So cool, let's start with protocol buffers. How do we, how do we implement that uh, with Clang? So the trick is we don't want to make any changes to the syntax. Um, Clang has this idea of a module map that you can give it in addition to the source code you give it. Um, and that basically describes what the C++ module will look like. If you have an example of a proto library, right, with a source p.proto that will generate a header p.pb.h, the module looks roughly like this, right? You have, it says header. Header means clang, this will be a header that I want in that module. Um, we, the dependencies are specified by saying use here, right? We use A and everything uses the STL, of course. And then we have the interesting part that's the export star. So, when we roll out modules, we want to make as few changes to the code base as we possibly can. So we try to have the semantic model match as closely to the old, like, include model. And if you include something, you can use everything in it. So we do export star, which tells Clang, well, everything in that header is exported. So somebody who uses that module 
um, can also use all symbols that are in that header. Now, one interesting part is that the protocol buffer headers also include other headers, right? They obviously include some stuff from the STL, but they also include their own utility libraries. For example, every protocol buffer header has a, um, every protocol buffer has a base class. So every protocol buffer header includes the header of that base class. And we thought first that, well, we don't want to go all over the code base and have to modularize everything. So we introduced the idea of textual headers. And we introduced that in the Clang module map so that um, you can basically declare a module message. That's not really a module because it will not compile any uh, PCM file out of it because the header in it is textual. And that means if Clang sees a, in a, when it compiles a module, it sees an include of that header, it will just include that textually. Now the interesting part is that because of the export star, all symbols from that header will also need to be exported. Um, so overall, let's look at when we made those changes, do we have to make any uh, changes because we expect the semantics to be different? So generally with modules, the core problem is that every header must stand on its own, right? It cannot be different depending on where it's used from. We will also, we will also detect some more ODR violations. Um, and we thought, well, over the code base, do we have ODR violations in protocol buffers? Perhaps a few, right? Probably not too many. We just fix them as we go. So it seems like we are all set up, right? The protocol buffer headers are, are a very simple uh, world. They stand on their own. Um, so let's roll that out. So we started implementing that in our build system and we started building code in our Google code base with that. As you expect, not all things went as we expected. So the first thing that happened was that module compiles were twice as slow as non-module compiles. That's unexpected. And it turned out that the problem here is that when we develop modules, we always tried it on small kind of examples, and then when we went in, and started to use it at Google scale, it turns out that we, we find some algorithmic problems that we didn't predict. So we have many translation units that depend transitively on thousands of protocol buffer files. Um, here we have an example, right? We have a t1.cc and that just depends on a lot of protocol buffer modules. Um, and all those protocol buffer modules uh, or the, the headers in those modules include the base class header, right? They include the uh, message.h which provides the class message. So as we said earlier, because of the export star, every one of those header modules actually contains that class. Now when we compile t1.cc and we load a protocol buffer, we need to actually go through all the modules and figure out that this exported symbol is the same in every header module. And this is a thousand uh, modules, right? So you have basically an ON in there that you have to do for every such symbol that you import. Now, we don't only have the message.h, right? The protocol buffer headers also include the STL, for example. So in the early days where we hadn't modularized the STL, what actually happened was that um, we put the STL into every one of those modules and when we started merging them, Clang ran over an int 32 for the number of preprocessed tokens that we found and crashed. Well, but that seems like an easy problem to fix. We just modularize the dependencies that we, we use from every protocol buffer and then we have the symbol in one place and everything's fine. The problem is with this, that this also means that we need to go now and actually modularize larger parts of the code base. 
the protocol buffers actually have a few, quite a few dependencies, and those have dependencies, and overall, you basically need the first layer that every protocol buffer includes to be modular, to, to work against that uh, pessimization. Okay, so what we did was we went over the code base and we started actually trying to compile normal code, non protocol buffer mo code as modules. And there you run into the problems you expect with the semantic changes you would get from modules. Right? The simplest example that actually happens a lot is um, somebody has a header, that header declares some function, something else, some other header uses that and does not include the first header. This of course works fine with the traditional C++ module where everything, if you just happen to include the files in the right order, everything works fine, right? But here B.h does not actually compile on its own, so when we try to compile it as a module, we get a compile error. So we went and started fixing them basically all over the code base. What else happens? We have, we have some people who really dislike having any implementation de details in their header. So what they came up with was the idea that, well, we, we also want really performant code, so we, we want our inline methods to be in the header, but we don't want them in the header that a user of my library would look at. Right. So they define a class, and then they, at the end of the header, they just hash include an impl.h, and that will give you all the, um, all the inline methods. The problem with that approach, right, again, the impl.h does actually not compile on its own. Uh, if, you, if you happen to follow the Google style guide, actually a while ago we changed the style guide to discourage at least those impl methods and to say that every header should stand on its own. Another thing that's interesting that breaks is C code. So the problem is that we have a lot of third party code. And some third party code is C only code where the authors don't really care that their code might be used from C++. So they don't want to sprinkle if the C++ extern C all over the headers, right? So what people do is they put the extern C around the hash include. Now this is a hash include that is hard to put, uh, to, to make into a modular use automatically. So we have some workarounds, but within our own build system, we don't have a really good solution here yet. Mainly because our, the names for C and C++ headers are basically the same, right? Both have the dot H ending. And so as long as our build system doesn't allow us to specify that these are C headers and these are C++ headers, we don't actually know which are which without, like, because they are compatible most. Then we come into the more arcane things that break when you do that. Um, so Clang thought that using under under module under under while it compiles a module is a good idea. And apparently the ARM C++ compiler forks thought they used that for something else. So we have some third party code in the code base that does weird things when it encounters that define. And that leads to random crashes. Another interesting story, what happened is that we pass all the module maps that describe to Clang how we want to compile the modules on the command line. And it turns out that these are so many module maps, again, this is like just the huge scale of the Google code base, that we actually broke the expectation of our build system on what the maximum command line length is. What we did to work around that again is that we then ran some graph algorithm on our dependency graph to only pass the top uh, modules on the command line, but running those graph algorithms is again expensive, so that actually makes your build slower. So we were basically fighting a bit with the build system here. And finally, one of the core things if you implement uh, modules in your code base is that you have to think about your configuration. And your configuration management, what do I mean with that? Everybody basically uses a couple of macros to switch between different configurations for their project, right? An open source project, that's often a config.h that gets generated. And with modules, um, you cannot mix these configurations anymore. 
right? The, one of the core things is debug versus opt. And for example, the assert library behaves differently whether you have the n assert uh, n debug uh, macro defined or not. Um, so code that actually has uh, a header that uses this library, right? For example, with an assert um, behaves differently when compiled with modules or without modules when people try to actually manually define that macro. So this code actually will give you currently with Clang, it will give you different results whether a.h comes from a module that was compiled uh, without the define or whether it's included naturally. Overall, the problem here is that if you think about it, um, you need a different header module for every possible combination of configuration flags you have. Um, that is mostly not actually as much as you would fear it might be. Right? Most code bases have a handful, or if they are very large code bases, they have might tens of different configurations. Um, so the overhead is probably not that bad. For now, we actually decided that uh, when you build, you select one uh, main configurations, and that's what we build the header modules for. And if any of the build files um, define some different combination uh, configurations, we will just not build the header modules. We will just continue to do textual inclusion. So, now we have implemented uh, modules for the protocol um, buffer headers, and we went over the code base and fixed all the problems. Our distributed build system now nicely supports modules. We know that how we handle all the configurations. So let's, let's flip the switch and see what happens. First, let's look back at the graph where we were at when we started with this whole thing. Right, this is what it looked like. The problem is that this was now a couple of years ago, and things had happened in the meantime. Specifically, the graph now looks like this. Things had improved. Why did they improve? Well, the problem was so bad that uh, a different set of people actually went and fixed the problem in the protocol compiler. Like what I told you in the beginning, one possible solution was to try to make the protocol uh, compiler generated files not need all the includes and still have the performance of all the inline functions. So we used a couple of template tricks to actually allow this and then migrated the whole code base to that model. And that got us a lot of benefit. So, now let's see what happens if in this situation we switch on models, right? At this point we were like, well, for, we didn't expect that much anymore. Let's see what happens. Well, we were pretty much right, right? Was some small increase. We had a 10% further decrease of the average compile times. Nothing major. But overall that's actually pretty nice um, because that 10% decrease in average compile times comes from a huge improvement in the 99th percentile. And the 99th percentile is what's what was really bad, right? That's the, I wait one minute to get back that my semicolon is missing. So that's pretty cool. But one of the things we really had hoped for was that the load of our distributed system would decrease. And we actually told the maintainers of our distributed build system, we'll switch on modules, we'll make your life easier. And then this happened. We actually doubled the load. So what has happened? We looked into that, and it turns out that we were just compiling more. So on average, we had a 10% improvement, um, and that translated to more than twice the number of translation units that we compile on an average day. So we have twice the amount of load. Where does this come from? So to understand that, we have to look into some more detail in like some idiosyncrasies of how our build looks. So we look at a more 
complex example here. I'll explain it quickly, right? We have three libraries, lib A, lib B, lib C. Lib C depends on lib B, lib B depends on lib A. Each of them has two headers, right? A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. And it has very sparse dependencies actually, right? So we have a translation unit C.cc that depends on C2, and the header C2.h just depends on, like includes the header B2.h. B2 and not, neither B1 nor B2.h include anything from the lib A, and the de dependency from lib B to lib A exists because there is a translation unit in lib B that actually includes a header from lib A. Right? And that's very typical of our code base. Now if you remember in the traditional model when we compile this, what would happen is that due to include scanning, we would figure out that c.cc only includes c2.h and b2.h, we would only send those to the, uh, to the worker, only those are the inputs. But now with our naive modules implementation, what happens is that the number of inputs actually increases a lot. So now we have all the header modules and the header files as input. And that means two things, first, the time it takes to stage all the inputs to the remote machine actually increases a lot. So we had this 10% improvement in average compile time. We had actually a much higher improvement in average compile time, but that got eaten up basically nearly fully by the time it takes to just stage all the additional inputs like the, the header modules to the machines. But more importantly, we now have more inputs. And if an input changes, you need to recompile your translation unit. So previously, right, only if C2 or B2 changed, we need to recompile C.cc. But now also if A1.h changes, we need to recompile C.cc. And that's really where this huge amount in new recompiles comes from, right? Because we have a lot of base libraries that very frequently change, and now we just recompile the world over and over again. The solution to that is basically translate the idea of include scanning to modules. And the idea is that we do include scanning, so we follow, locally follow the set of includes that we find, and every time we find uh, an, a header that is part of a module, we mark that module as an input. And all other modules are not inputs. So in this case, we can actually see that lib A, module A.pcm will not be used. We don't need to ship it, it's not an input. This is something we currently are in the process of rolling out, we haven't rolled that out yet, but uh, early results indicate that that will actually get most of the uh, problem of the increased load out of the way. Now, if I, if I do a very simple modification to this, we still cannot solve that with the include scanning. And that is we have an additional include from b1.h to a1.h. Now the problem is that due to the way modules works, um, the, a, a naive include scanning would not find that, but when we include scan from c.cc to c2.h to b2.h, we now have to also include scan all the different headers in that module, right? Because the compiler actually needs to know about these headers. So remember in the old model we would just send c2.h and b2.h, but now we would again send everything. What's the solution here? The only solution here we can think of is actually to make people split up libraries. Because if you look at it, the headers in lib b are actually not tightly coupled. So are the headers in lib h, right? We have a complete different dependency graph. So we can split up the libraries. Now we have three more libraries, each with their own header. And now we can, when we compile that as module, we actually have exactly the same order of magnitude as impu of inputs as in the traditional model. Now splitting up libraries can sometimes be hard. Our uh, goal is to give people tools to do that. So, to wrap it up, the results we got were, right, we had 50% better compile times, up to 50% in the 99th percentile. I think it was like 30% on average in the 99th percentile. Uh, we had an average improvement of 
we had a large increase in the overall load of the system. Um, but on the upside, we have unlocked a lot, a lot of optimization potential. Why is that? Right? We have taken a lot of work that the compiler has to do and that it has no chance of not doing, right? It has to recompile all the files it sees, reparse all the files it sees. And we put that into the build system, right? And now in the build system, we actually can pull a lot of tricks to make that faster. That's something we are very good at. And we have a lot of ideas how to like, make that significantly faster overall. And also, we gain some insight into how modules behave, what the corner cases are, how to actually migrate our code base, and in the process, we've actually got our code base a lot closer to what we think it will be once, need to be once modules launches, once modules is um, in the standard, so that we can then migrate our code base to a like standardized modules model very quickly. We have a couple of things that we learned that worked very well, and we have a couple of things that didn't go as well. Let's look at the stuff that worked well, right? Um, one very good thing about our code base is that we have a very strict style guide and people actually mostly adhere to it. And that means that um, we had to fix things, right, the semantic problems, but the order of magnitude of the fixes was tractable, right? It was a couple of 10,000 fixes. That's actually something like that takes a couple of days of work. We have, uh, we have a lot of tools that help us migrate our code base at large. Right? That made it very easy. And because of completely different reasons, our code base already specified headers in the build files. Right? And that's also interesting because that helped us because specifying all the headers in the build files on its own is actually a very large project. And we had started to do that for, for different reasons because we actually want to uh, control better what people can include um, a couple of years before that. So that was also very nice. We got lucky there. A couple of things that didn't go as expected, right? The performance improvement, our predictions were not totally off, but a couple of things obviously went differently from how we expected them. Um, turns out some broken code was hard to fix. And mostly that was not the scale, but for example, when we modularize the STL, an STL, mod an STL implementation that's not written with modules in mind seems to be quite hard to modularize. You have to talk with Richard or Chandler about that. They will give you war stories. Um, modules makes the code harder to distribute. So we actually had to put a lot of effort into making that work with our distributed build system, right? You saw most of the problems we had were due to interactions with the distributed build systems. And also we lived on the bleeding edge of Clang, so we naturally ran into quite a bit of Clang bugs. Richard also always nicely, quickly fixed them, um, but the diagnostics, if you, if you get diagnostics for bugs in your compiler, uh, that is often very challenging. And with that, questions. So I'm, I may have missed it, but I, I kept waiting for you to show a big picture of an elephant and say something about templates. Um, um, you will need to come to Richard's talk in the afternoon, I think. Okay. Like, yes, Richard implemented the template merging in Clang, and that is a story on its own. Uh, can you speak a little bit about what happened to link times? Um, okay, can I speak about link times? So we had some initial problems with link times, mainly because of static initializers that showed up now in every module, uh, but we fixed that, and I think link times were after that, after the fixes, link times were pretty much unaffected. So uh, you mentioned that you encourage uh, your developers to break up libraries into smaller chunks. Uh, aren't you concerned that the number of libraries will explode because of this, and also that 
the, the break lines uh, would become slightly arbitrary along dependencies rather than along functionality. Of course, these two often align well, but not always. So the question is, uh, if I understand it correctly, um, the idea to encourage developers to split up libraries more uh, might lead to too many libraries or libraries that are not well cohesive. Right. Um, so generally we found that developers tend to bundle too much into a library. And the problem is that that is also an incentive for you to write bad code because within the library we allow you to have cyclic dependencies. And that means you split out less, like you modularize your code less because you just have those include cycles within your library. So you actually, you actually start creating larger and larger blobs of things that are really hard to split apart. But often you actually have things in, in there that you would want to split apart that have completely different sets of dependencies, right? And that's really problematic because the set of dependencies um, means that if you, if you have to, if you have a library that has too many dependencies, it will be recompiled way too often. And that's the case with modules and without modules. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think for, for incentivizing people, I actually think smaller libraries make for more modular code. And regarding the number of libraries, we've not seen that our build system has any problems with that. On the contrary, because you have more precise dependency chains, it leads to just less recompilation and less work you have to do in the build system. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, you've mentioned that this change enabled you to have uh, loads of optimization potential. And what do you actually have in mind with potential? Uh, what? Um, so the question is, I said we have optimization potential. So you saw that for the overall load of, the, um, of our build system, it went up. Um, but if you, if you remember the, the graph in the distributed uh, build system, you in the non modulus case, you reparse the, the, all the same headers over and over and over again. Um, so obviously there's potential to get rid of, like we got rid of some of that, but um, we put that basically into the recompilation of the same uh, translation unit due to dependency, due to new dependencies. And if we can get rid of those dependencies, we reap both the benefits of not recompiling the same header as part of every translation unit, as well as then not recompiling the same translation unit with modules because of increased dependencies. So that's where we expect the, the large decrease in, in overall load and also another decrease in compile time to come from. Also, um, as you've seen with this merging example, the more of your code base is modularized, the more benefits you get out of it. Um, a few questions that I've got, but maybe I'll just stick it to two. Um, do you guys use uh, Unity builds at all or anything like that? Like uh, C files including other C files? So the question is whether we use Unity builds. Uh, the answer is no. We generally don't believe in Unity builds. Uh, the other question then would be, do you use uh, shared libraries or DLLs? Uh, that might make it difficult to split your libraries. Like. Uh, the question is whether we use shared libraries. We actually do use currently to use shared libraries when we build tests, and we don't use shared libraries when we build stuff to deploy. Um, I don't understand, so you, you mentioned that you think that that might be harder to split up libraries. I don't understand why that would be. So the, the, the core idea about our build system is that we always rebuild everything from scratch. So we build shared libraries, but we don't deploy them ever. Does that make sense? So splitting it up, we'll just split yeah, up the I'm, library into two shared libraries. I'm thinking the problems around exports and imports and getting them correctly around circular dependencies uh, would be my thoughts. If you break the library at an arbitrary point, it might be difficult to solve those. So the problem is if you have circular dependencies, splitting up libraries is hard. Yeah. And that is true, that is true in general. Uh, our build system does not allow circular dependencies between libraries. Like, and it never did. So that's where, why if you can split it in our build system, you actually solve that problem. Uh, Linux also allows circular dependencies between shared libraries, I think, so, but anyway. Yes? Um, do you have any insights into removing inline and using link time optimizations to offset the 
performance cost in order to get faster compile times. So do we want to remove inline and uh, uh, use link time optimization? So I'm not the expert on that. You have to ask Chandler for the details. But I think the high level is we have no plan to remove inline, but we do actually develop uh, link time optimizations because they help a lot. Thank you. You mentioned that there's um, analysis to understand dependencies that are declared but not actually used. Does that feed back into some kind of tooling so that you actually restructure your code and don't declare, you don't actually have the include file for the module? So we have dependencies that are not really used, and the question is, does that feel, feed into tooling? Actually, we are currently building up tools to get that dependency better under control, because, partly because what we learned from the modules uh, experiment, and we learned that um, we really need to get our dependencies in order. So we are currently building up tools to help you uh, also split up libraries and which dependencies you want to delete that give you the most benefit um, and things like that. So like Clang include what you use is insufficient for this task? Do I claim include what you use is insufficient for this task? Uh, yes. Hey, uh, okay. do you expect more build time improvements when modules become standard or you think you already take all the benefits? Do we expect more build time improvements when modules become standardized? Um, I think that's orthogonal. I expect more build time improvements in the future, right? Um, Richard has put some effort into making modules faster, obviously, but I think if we prioritize making Clang, Clang's module implementation faster, that we can get additional build time improvements. But that is like orthogonal to how it's standardized, I think. Well, depends on some of the standardization, but that's all open, so I, I don't know yet, right? Thank you. Uh, can you comment on other uh, potential ideas for build improvements that were considered at Google? Let's say, you know, um, can we figure out what can be forward declared rather than, you know, including a header file? Um, or how about uh, splitting header files into in individual uh, concepts so that uh, header file wouldn't have more than one class in it so that then we can benefit from incremental builds um, a little bit more because if there are changes to the header file, it would affect fewer CPP files that only depend those, on those things that are in the header file, um, things like that. Have you guys done any like uh, uh, big changes like that across entire code base to simplify those things? So the question is how we uh, split up libraries. And um, the question is, what you described is something that isn't applicable to many companies because modules, it is a preparation for modules. Uh, are there any other efforts like the protobuf that you described across entire Google to speed up the build times? Let's say, you know, uh, using forward declares is one. Ah, you mean that there are efforts that were not, like now we rolled out modules, were there efforts before that to speed up build times without using modules? Right, or in parallel. Okay. Um, well, in parallel, as you saw, right, we have right. actually um, got a lot of benefit out of changing the protocol compiler. Um, and we had some people investigating, for example, forward declares. Um, the interesting part was that from the start, like forward declarations actually have different problems often um, because the problem is that they prevent you as a library maintainer from changing types uh, without changing all the code. So we actually never went very far into trying to force forward declares all over the code base. Uh, we had them obviously because of performance, but we hope that we can get rid of them more in the modules world because they don't help anymore, right? Mm -hmm. But okay. they, they do still help some with the, with the decoupling, but it's also not really a decoupling. So we, we hope we can live in a world where we don't need forward declarations as right. much. And this is just an example. How about pimple pattern or something like that? So the question is, how about the input patterns? I'm not a big fan of the input pattern, but it just makes code more complex to work around your build system. I think modules is the right solution, that we have a fundamentally different compilation model that enables you to not need workarounds in your code and make your code more complex 
just so that the compiler doesn't like isn't completely crazy, right? Got it. Thanks. Um, am I correct in understanding that you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between libraries and modules? There's one module per library, one library per module. Uh, the question is whether we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between libraries and modules. Um, where modules are enabled, currently, yes. So we also use a an, an implementation detail of Clang that's uh, that that submodules, but uh, going into that would probably go too far. But generally, there is one library, one module. Okay. So within a single library, <coughs> do you get any benefit from modules then? Do we get benefits from modules within a single library? I don't think so. Okay. I come from the Windows world, um, so I'm not up to date at all the Clang technologies. However, one of the things I kept expecting you to mention, or at least have some, some talk about, because I believe it exists, is the concept of precompiled headers. Uh, it was, is that just not allowed in the distributed build system, or can you talk about that? So I, I did mention it very shortly, I think. Uh, we had people look into precompiled headers. I know precompiled headers in the Windows world, um, but the problem is the way you use precompiled headers there, I think, is that you very early on you decide you have a precompiled header. This will be my precompiled header, and I just put all the other headers into that, and everybody includes that one header. Um, in a large distributed code base, that is problematic because you get this the single point of dependency where everything depends on, and again you get this dependency, uh, like the, the recom like if any of the headers needs to be recompiled, the precompiled header, the precompiled header needs to be recompiled, and everything that depends on it needs to be pre uh, recompiled, and that's something we want to try to get rid of. And also, uh, in a code base that was not written that way, you don't naturally have those points. So what people actually do is, right, you include one header from this library, one header from that library, and somebody else includes the other header from this and the other header from that library. And we actually had people go in and try to use precompiled headers, but because they needed to keep the code compiling, because we also didn't have uh, a, pro like there was no idea that modules would come and actually require everybody to rethink how they think about semantics of C++ anyway, uh, that completely failed. And an another unrelated question, you had mentioned that you're trying hard to get your dependencies together. Um, our, our, our company is, is doing that as well. Do you have any uh, interesting or, or useful visualization tools to see the uh, dependency graph between headers and, and libraries and whatnot, or have you developed those, or do you find those useful? So the question is, do we have visualization tools for our dependencies? So we have people who have hacked together tools like websites where you can watch the dependencies, and it's not helpful. <laughs> If you want to see spaghetti, yes, you see spaghetti. Um, we, we have actually created tools that help you guide which dependencies are actually important and you need to look at. As a human, it's just so much code and like, right, it's multiple hundred million lines of C++ code. If you look at that dependency graph, you see nothing, right? But for a tool, it can actually figure out, so if you, if you, if you remove these five dependencies, now suddenly you actually have two components that are completely split apart, and you will save that many test runs from running when anything in the transitive closure changes, right? And those things, those things are the things we're focusing on, and less on visualization. Thank you. All right, just a simple question. Why did you choose to distinguish between modular and non-modular headers and describe those modules explicitly in your build files instead of just generating a PCM file out of every header you have to speed up the build process. So why did we not just create modules, like switch on modules everywhere, basically? Yeah, it so doesn't work that. because most of the code, like you have to change code in order to, um, in order to make it work with modules. And I think we are over time. Sorry.